Well, we've just about made it to the end of another year. As we sit here in December, the first Sunday of the month, the last month of our year, a a lot of times it allows our minds to begin working in very specific ways that normally we wouldn't be thinking about in other parts of the year. It's one of those unique times where mentally we are really equipped to look backwards, maybe over the past year, but yet at the same time look forwards to the year that is to come. A month like this at the very end of the year really lends itself to be thinking about those kinds of things for whatever purpose, for whatever reason, just easier than in other months of the year. And so we're going to take advantage of that a little bit today, both this morning as well as this afternoon. And this morning, we're going to talk about the importance of a little bit of perspective, that if we can have foundational perspective, the difference that it can really make in our lives, and we're going to do that this morning. If you can be with us this afternoon, we're going to be looking forward a bit, and we're going to be doing so as a church, as a church here at Traders Point, looking forward the benefits that we can have in an exercise like that. So if you're able to be back with us uh, at 5 o'clock this afternoon, that would be the plan for then. But this morning, a little perspective. The thought for this lesson really derived from a couple of weeks ago on Wednesday night when we had, instead of Bible class, a, a time that we could be here together the day before Thanksgiving here for us. A day in which we were able to worship here together, here in this room, that we prayed together in very specific ways, that we read some passages, that we praised God through song in very specific kind of ways. And what that did is it lended us, instead of being so general at times, which is our temptation when it comes to our relationship with God, to really hone in on a few things. The purpose of that is to lend perspective in a lot of ways. So I want to take a piece of that this morning, and I want to dig deeper into that idea for a few minutes. And I want us to think deeply, and I want us to think honestly about what it is that God does for us. And we're going to be using a story in the Old Testament in the book of 1 Kings in chapter 17. We're going to pick up our story where Brian left off reading for us. And we're going to see through this story, through this lesson, for Elijah. Yeah, there were other beneficiaries in this story. We'll talk about them. But 1 Kings chapter 17 is a story about Elijah, what he needed, what God was looking for from him and what God did for him. As we just read in 1 Kings chapter 17, at the beginning of chapter 17, although uh, Elijah is a prominent figure in the Old Testament, when it comes to the Jews specifically, even in the pages of the New Testament, when Elijah is made mention of, they know exactly who he is. He is representative of the prophets as Moses is representative of the law. And although he is a prominent figure in the pages of the Old Testament, he really hasn't found his story in all that much Scripture, which is interesting to me. And he is introduced for us just here in 1 Kings chapter 17. Now things move very quickly for him in his story, and maybe that's why it's so fascinating to read because his story moves so rapidly. But it is here in the beginning of 1 Kings chapter 17 that we are introduced to Elijah for the very first time. And we are introduced to him in a way in which he delivers to the king of Israel devastating news. There's going to be a famine in the land. And it will be a famine that won't last a few days or a few weeks or even a few months. So we, we know in areas like here in our country that if we are in a drought and a drought that lasts weeks or a drought that lasts months, the the ripple effects of that, even in our ecosystem. But this was a drought that would last not weeks or not months, but years. In a part of the world that depends upon that rain, and it just won't come for a long, long time. 
And after he delivers that news, he is called away by God. And God puts him in a place at a brook. And he provides for him there. If you read, if you were listening as we were reading for 1 Kings chapter 17, as God puts him there in this place where he would be then given water there at the brook, the ravens even came sent by God to feed him. But after a time there, he's called away by God again, but this time to a place called Zarephath. And we're going to read this text. And I want you to be thinking about putting yourself in the shoes of Elijah this morning. I made mention there were other characters in this story, prominent characters, beneficiaries even of God and his goodness, but the lesson is Elijah and what he's being taught by God. And so for us this morning, that's where we want to place ourselves, in his shoes to learn his lessons. In 1 Kings chapter 17, beginning in verse 8, down through verse 16, listen to the story. He says, the word of the Lord came to him, that is Elijah, and, and he says, arise, go to Zarephath, which belongs to Sidon, and dwell there. See, I have commanded a widow there to provide for you. And so he arose and went to Zarephath, and when he came to the gate of the city, indeed a widow was there gathering sticks. And he called to her, and he said, please bring me a little water and a cup that I may drink. And as she was going to get it, he called to her and said, please bring me a morsel of bread in your hand. And so she said, as the Lord your God lives, I do not have bread, only a handful of flour in a bin a little oil in a jar, and see I am gathering a couple of sticks that I may go in and prepare it for myself and my son that we may eat it and die. And Elijah said to her, do do not fear, go and do as you have said, but make me a small cake from it first and bring it to me and, and afterward make some for yourself and your son. For thus says the Lord God of Israel, the bin of flour shall not be used up nor shall the jar of oil run dry until the day the Lord sends rain on the earth. And so she went away and did according to the word of Elijah. And she and he and her household ate for many days. And the bin of flour was not used up, nor did the jar of oil run dry according to the word of the Lord, which he spoke by Elijah. It's an incredible story. But let's not lose sight of the beginning. To me, in a lot of ways, the beginning is the key. Because it is the lesson that he is going to learn. That although here, as he is at the very beginning of this story, at a brook in which he is very aware, God is providing for him there. It's the water that he's drinking. The birds are bringing meat in for him to eat. He understands that God is providing for him here. He probably understands that other people in other places are struggling because of the famine, but God is sustaining him, and that's what he does. And to prove that point, he asks Elijah to leave. But what's really interesting to me is it's where he tells him to go. Oftentimes we make the point that he tells them to leave where he is, east of the Jordan, and go to Zarephath, a city of the Sidonians, or a city of Sidon. And we'll make the point, and rightly so, I think there is a point to be made there, that in a lot of ways he is doing what we often will call going behind enemy lines. Ahab, who's married to Jezebel, Ahab, a terrible person and a terrible king. Jezebel, a terrible person. They're not super excited about Ahab or Elijah and the the news that he has delivered. We learn a little bit further on into the story of Elijah, Ahab, and Jezebel. Right after uh, 1 Kings chapter 18, they're, they're looking for him and they want to kill him because of all that's transpired. And he goes to a city of Zarephath in the place of Phoenicia, the Sidonians, where Jezebel is from. And we often will make the point that, man, that's a scary place to be. It's a scary place to go. And certainly it is. 
But let us not lose sight of what we learn at the end of verse 9. You see, Elijah has been spending his time at a, 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 here at Brook where he has been provided for everything that he needs. And God says, it's time to go. And here's where you're going to go. You're going to go to the house of a widow. And she is going to provide for you. Now, what do we know about widows at this time? Widows at this time, certainly this time of Scripture, I think a lot of ways uh, the book of Ruth gives us a great picture of the struggle that a widow had during this time. It was a massive struggle. A widow at a time of flourishing weather struggled mightily to provide just for herself and for her children if she had any. But we're not at a time of flourishing weather. We're at a time of great famine. And God says, I want you to go. You're going to be provided for. It is the house of a widow. Did you notice? She will provide for you. This widow. The neediest of people at this time. The neediest of people. Well, what's the point? Well, one of the points is that God sins and we must obey and just leave the rest up to him. You see, oftentimes we live on wanting explanation from man instead of just leaning on promises that God has made. God has made promises to protect. He has made promises to comfort. And in times of difficulty, it's easy to forget those promises because we focus then on what's happening around us, the circumstance of our world, of our life. Elijah could have done that. He could have been, man, it's going well for me right here. What is this widow going to have for me? But he doesn't. He gets up and he goes. And even the picture that is given to us of this widow is sad. How was she introduced to us? This is introduced to us gathering. A huge pile of, of sticks and firewood. What did the text say? A couple of sticks. A couple of sticks. He says, can you get me a drink of water? And she's able to do that. Can you bring me a piece of bread? I can't. She was not being hyperbolic. She was not exaggerating when she says, I have but just a little flour in a bin. And I have just a little oil left. And her current reality was with that little flour and that little oil and these couple of sticks, I'm going to make a a cake. My son and I are going to eat it, and that'll be all that we have to eat ever again. That's her reality. This is who God says to Elijah is going to provide for you. It's unbelievable to think about. This woman with a couple of sticks, this woman with a tiny amount of flour, this woman a tiny amount of oil, her assets were so limited. But God's are so incredible. So the simple lesson, number one, a perspective. God sustains our lives. For Elijah, it was a very simple lesson. He was at the brook and had water there given by God, birds bringing him meat to eat. He goes to this woman's house where miraculously flour doesn't run out, oil doesn't go away. And it was a lesson that, yes, he needed to learn, but a lesson that probably was somewhat simple for him to grab hold of. Now, for us here in 2022, in Indianapolis, Indiana, it is the same lesson that we have to learn. The same perspective we have to have, but for us, 
very difficult. Because I drive to Kroger, just like you do. And the amount of choices of food that I have is astounding. It is so astounding how often, and if you're very different than me, then good for you. But how often, and I find myself maybe in the past year more than any other time, I go to Kroger, or I go to Walmart, I go to the grocery for something very specific, maybe a specific brand of something, and I go to a shelf full of food, I mean full of food, and the one specific thing that I'm looking for is out, and I'm upset about that. I'm like, are you kidding me? They don't have mild breakfast sausage, only medium here today? Who's eating all the mild sausage? Who's done all that? You see, that is our reality. In our modern culture, not just with grocery stores, but restaurants and fast food restaurants on every corner, it makes it a challenge for us to listen, to keep in mind that every meal that we have is a generous gift from the hand of God. Think about Matthew chapter 6. In Matthew chapter 6, you can hold your finger in 1 Kings chapter 17. We're going to come back to that and finish that story here in just a moment. But in Matthew chapter 6, in the, uh, the Sermon on the Mount, or Jesus is teaching uh, about his kingdom and disciples that were to be a part of his kingdom. And he's talking about uh, a prayer, and he's making a point. And, and certainly in the midst of this point about prayer, the, the overarching point that he's making is that that you need to be praying and when you're praying to focus on God not to focus on man that but that God he is to be your focus and he gives a for instance prayer a for instance prayer and in Matthew chapter 6 in his for instance prayer he says this in verse 9 in this manner therefore pray our father in heaven Hallowed be your name, your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Look at verse 11. You know it. Give us this day our daily bread. I I want us to understand the, the idea behind that. In this, for instance, prayer from God, he he is... He's teaching us that this is so much more than just a little line in a prayer that that Jesus is teaching. Uh, It is the expression of an incredible truth that God takes care of us. Maybe the power that he has to use many hands to feed us. Now, possibly the struggle for us is the line of those hands is long. For Elijah, those hands, that line was very short. God provided the water. Birds came and brought him meat. The woman had the jar, the bin of flour that God filled up. But it's no less true for us. That every single time that we are sustained in this world with a drink of water, with a bite of food, to fuel our physical bodies. It is a generous gift from God. And he, for us here, uses many hands to get it to us. Now, why is that such an important lesson? Well, it's such an important lesson because it teaches us dependence. What Satan wants is he wants us to think we can do for ourselves. You drove to Kroger. You cooked that food. You went to the restaurant. You paid for that food with your own money. Look at what you've done. 
You can do this all on your own. But the lesson, the big perspective lesson is God sustains life. And how thankful that we need to be each and every time that we have an incredible opportunity to fuel ourselves. And I was thinking about that on that Wednesday night as we were praying specifically about just the food that we have. And I was thinking about personally that in our family, each and every time we sit down for a meal, we offer a prayer, and it's been that way, not just in the family that I have now, but in the family that I was brought up in. And how easy it is for a prayer such as that to become very trivial and very trite, but yet how pivotal that foundational principle is. God sustains life, but not just that, God gives life. If you go back to 1 Kings chapter 17, the story of Elijah and this widow doesn't end here. It continues on, and there's one more foundational principle that we have. In 1 Kings chapter 17, beginning of verse 17, it says that now it happened after these things that the son of the woman who owned the house became sick, and his sickness was so serious that there was no breath left in him. And so she said to Elijah, well, what have I have to do with you, O man of God? Have have you come to bring my my sin to remembrance and to kill my son? And, And he said to her, give me your son. And so he took him out of her arms, and he carried him into the upper room where he was staying and laid him on his own bed. And then he cried out to the Lord and said, O Lord, my God, have you also brought tragedy on the widow with whom I lodge by killing her son? And he stretched himself out on the child three times and cried out to the Lord and said, Lord, my God, I pray, let this child's soul come back to him. And the Lord heard the voice of Elijah, and the soul of the child came back to him, and he revived. And Elijah took the child and brought him down from the upper room into the house and gave him to his mother. And Elijah said, see, your son lives. And the woman said to Elijah, now by this I know that you are a man of God and that the word of the Lord in your mouth is the truth. I believe in Scripture this is the first recorded instance of someone being raised from the dead, and that is most certainly what he was. There's arguments that people try to make that the son was just sick and hadn't passed away, but that's not the way that Elijah and this woman deals with it and thinks about it. To the point of verse 17 that his breath has left him. That's going to come into key when we make application here in just a moment. I love the picture of the relationship that Elijah must have had with this woman. There's some time that he spends just from the brook and this time at this woman's house, three years pass. So there's some time that he is there and the relationship that he would have had with this family and the way he handles the boy by carrying him up to the room and pleading with God multiple times and God hearing and responding. There's an incredible resort that takes place, a result that takes place because of this, this woman's confession of her faith in God, knowing that the word that Elijah brought were the very words of God, the words of truth. But the lesson is not just that God sustains life, but the big picture perspective is that God gives life. So for us, in a very generalized, specific, don't you like that phrase, generalized, specific? The way I like is the picture given to us of this boy who passes and his breath is taken. But then his breath given back. And as I was thinking about it this week, it is the reality that every breath that I let out is a gift given to me by God. Now what difference does it make if we begin to think that way, have that kind of perspective? That every breath that I release 
is a gift from God. It's his that he has provided me. Well, it causes me to have a perspective now of what am I doing with those breaths. How would you feel if you were to provide for me a gift that you worked on? Let's say you made for me a vase, a clay vase, and you worked long hours on it, and you you put it on a a, a ceramic wheel, and you 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 formed it out, and you 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 put it in the kiln, and you worked the glaze, and you made it just perfect. Hours and hours and hours you spent. And you made it a a perfect color of red because you know it's my favorite color. And you presented this to me. Look, I have I have made you this vase, and I and I take it and I lift it above my head and I smash it on the ground. How would you feel about that? This gift that you gave, this thing that you presented, that you made. My guess is you wouldn't feel great about that. The way that I handled that. Now, what about God? With the breath that he provides to me, I speak unkindly to others. Or I curse. Or I blaspheme him. Or with the breath that I have, I don't praise. Or I'm thankful. I'm selfish. You see, it's big picture perspective to be thinking about with the breath that I have, which is given to us by God, what am I doing with it? You see, these big picture perspective things, as we close, I think was preparing Elijah for some things. You see, remember in 1 Kings chapter 17, we're introduced to Elijah. This is the very first things that he's doing. He's sitting by a brook, eating what the raven's bringing. He's spending time just with this widow and her son. Now, yes, he goes on and he does huge, big picture things for God. Even in the very next chapter in 1 Kings chapter 18. But he's not doing that here. But he's learning. And his perspective is shifting. I'm not sure you can have 1 Kings chapter 18 without 1 Kings chapter 17. You see, we see that lesson from Jesus. Let's close with this. Matthew chapter 25 in the sermon of the parable of the talents. Uh, Jesus has given us this incredible story of the parable of the talents. But do you remember what he says to the, the five talent and the two talent man? The five talent and the two talent man. They come back and they say, look, we have, we, have, uh, we have doubled. Here's your five talents and five more talents. Here's your two talents and your two more talents. And God responds to them each both the same. I've really been thinking about it a lot lately, and it is to me what we see here in 17 and what happens in 1 Kings chapter 18. Look at what's said. In Matthew chapter 25, in verse 20, he says that you had received five talents. The one who had received five talents came and brought five other talents, saying, Lord, you delivered to me five talents. Look, I've gained five more besides them. Now listen to the response, verse 21. And as Lord said to him, well done, good and faithful servant. We love that line, right? We love that one. We recite that line all the time. But he's not done speaking. Well done, good and faithful servant. Listen, you were faithful over a few things. I will make you ruler over many things. You were faithful over these these few things. Now you are ready for something much bigger. The two-talent man, he says the exact same thing. I can't help but to think about 1 Kings chapter 17. And then what occurs in 1 Kings chapter 18 when Elijah stands alone on a mountain facing the prophets of Baal. And for us here, if our perspective is where it needs to be, maybe we are being prepared 
for what comes next. People who prove themselves faithful with a few things can then be trusted by God with many. And what a powerful, powerful lesson that is. Well, let's close. In Luke chapter 4, when we're studying the gospel of Luke uh, at McDonald's on Tuesday mornings, a few of us, in Luke chapter 4, Jesus is uh, preaching in the synagogue and, and people are amazed at what he has to say. And they're enjoying his lesson. But then he references two stories in Luke chapter 4. He references Naaman and Elisha, and the one who has to dip in the, the river to be cleansed. But right before that, he mentions this story in 1 Kings chapter 17 of this woman from Zarephath. And the point that is made is as he mentions these two stories, Naaman and this woman, this widow from Zarephath, not Jews but Gentiles. And this time they were not happy with what he had to say. They pick him up. They carry him to the edge of a cliff in order to throw him off even. And he miraculously goes through their midst. What was the point that Jesus is making by telling that story? The graciousness of God. His love for everyone. And as Tim leads us in a song of invitation, I want you to be considering that this morning. His love for you. The gift of salvation that he has brought. And if you're here this morning, and it is your sin which is separating you from God, God has made a way for that sin to go away. In the waters of baptism, the incredible gift of salvation, the sacrifice that has been made. It's an incredible thing that God has done for us. And as we sing this song this morning, you be considering that and thinking about it. And maybe we can help you with that in some way this morning. Or maybe there's something else of a spiritual nature that you need to make right in your life. I would urge you to do that this morning. Maybe it's just between you and God. If it is, take care of that. But maybe it's something we can help with. If that's the case, you let us know as we stand and sing.